you, Angie. Uh, hopefully my dulcet tones don't bore you too much tonight, um, and I promise not to break into song at any point because when it comes to superannuation this year, there is definitely nothing worth singing about. Um, now, I wrote the title, Superannuation, The Picture Becomes Clearer. And after I put that down, I thought, that's actually quite ironic um, because I think it's become clearer in the, you know, if I didn't have my glasses on and I was looking at it, the type of clearer. Um, the fact is, let's have a look at what's actually happened in the year that was, um, a big year for superannuation. Now, on the 3rd of May, 2016, was the budget. And in amongst the budget, there was the raft of superannuation changes. Now, those of you that came to my uh, budget brief would recall maybe that I had a tooth pulled out on the 3rd of May. Um, and I made a joke at the time that that wasn't the most painful thing that happened to me that day. It was at 7.30 that night when this budget was released. And I stick by that. Uh, I would almost rather be having another tooth pulled out at the moment than going through the legislation. The 2nd of July, they took those changes to the election and they won. Um, mainly because Labor also had a lot of changes. So while it was a battlefield, everybody was changed in one way or the other, so it was always going to come through. 16th of September, the backflip, the, the revolt in the backbench. Now that was a quite remarkable situation, I think, for us to get a head around where nobody was happy with the $500,000 lifetime limit. So that, that had taken all the headlines, I think, in the, the preceding months, and that then got removed. So scrapped completely. So all that effort, all that thinking that had gone into how we were planning for that, and people not making contributions, went out the window. It went back to the way it was. Um, amazing. 22nd of November, the changes passed through the House of Representatives, so last Tuesday. And on the 23rd of November, they passed through the Senate. So some robust debate obviously occurred um, about the legislation in the form that it was done by Treasury and there were no changes. I think um, Labor said it's good enough. It's not perfect but it's good enough at the moment. So we have what we have and this is what we're going through. So I'll recap um, on what the changes are now so we can refresh our memory from the budget um, and unfortunately most of the changes there hasn't really been much tinkering with them. Um, while there's a lot of detail in them, the fundamentals are still the same. The concessional contributions cap, those tax deductible contributions that you have from an employer or personally, they have been reduced to 25,000 from the 1st of July 2017 for everybody. Um, unfortunately, they are 30 and 35,000 this year and that's being cut down to 25,000. A lot easier to, for us to, as accountants to tell people because we only remember one number, but it's come down quite a bit. Now, in 2008, it was $100,000 if you're over 50. So, while it seems like it's not a huge deduction now, it, over the last few years, it's, it's come down quite dramatically. The increased access to the personal contributions, um, the 10% rule has been removed. Now, that's a bit of an accounting terminology, the 10% rule. That's where, if more than 10% of your income comes from an employment source, you are entitled to claim a personal tax deduction for your contributions. So you may think that's fine, people will just be having um, their employer put the contributions in. Well no, employers are only required to put in the 9.5%. There's no requirement that they salary sacrifice. So they may not offer it. So there is people in the situation where they get their 9.5%, it might be $15,000, they've got no ability or had no ability to up that to their full limit. That's gone. Now, if you want to top it up, you put your own money in and you claim it in your tax uh, return. So that makes it a lot easier and a lot fairer, I think, moving forward. So that's one of the good things um, that happened. It's effective from the 1st of July 2017. As once again, you may recall, I droned on throughout the budget brief about effective 1st of July 2017, effective 1st of July 2017, and that all still remains the same. Um, and that means that anyone under the age of 75 will have the ability to do personal contributions and claim a tax deduction for. So, good news, I think. There's the catch-up concessional contributions. Now, this is where if you don't use that full $25,000 contribution in a particular year, you can carry it forward to the next year. So, in other words, gone is the use it or lose it system that we have at the moment. At the moment, if you don't put in your full amount, bad luck. Next year, you get a new cap and you start again. Here, this is catering towards those broken work patterns 
um, directed, they say, at stay-at-home mums, people on maternity leave, etc. But it's wider reaching that's anybody that sort of has broken work patterns, goes overseas, comes back, any situation like that, um, they can be carried forward for up to five years. So you can carry forward up to five years worth of concessional contributions, which isn't too bad. It's $125,000 you can put in in one year. Now you might not need deductions in the four previous years, suddenly you realise it's a capital gain, you can whack your whole $125,000 in in one hit, claim a deduction for it. Unfortunately, it's effective from 1 July 2018. That was part of the shuffling around when they got rid of the lifetime uh, cap on non-concessional contributions. They traded it off by delaying this for a year. So we've got to wait a year, but it's still coming in, presumably. Um, now, the thing is, it doesn't start accruing until the 1st of July 2018 either. So any contributions you don't make this year or next year don't get carried forward. Of course, there's a catch, as there always is with the government and superannuation. It's only available if you've got less than $500,000 in super. So that's where some potential planning comes involved in it. If you've got less than $500,000, make your catch-up concessional contributions before you potentially make a non-concessional contribution or have some other growth, roll money over, well, that wouldn't work, but um, yeah, it's something to keep in mind, that $500,000. Now, our first new acronym. I've been extremely pleased to see the government's brought out a raft of new acronyms for superannuation. It wasn't confusing enough, so let's make it all sound a bit easier by just shortening it into acronyms. That, that makes a lot more sense. Um, so we've got the transfer balance cap. That's where you can only have $1.6 million in pension phase, tax-free pension phase. So that was one of the big talking points from the budget. Um, if you've got more than that, it's effective from 1st of July 2017. If you've got more than 1.6 million, it's going to have to stay in accumulation. So anybody with 1.7 million, well, that'll roll back into accumulation. So that's been a fair talking point, and I'll go into that in more detail um, in some examples. Now another acronym, you've, your TBC will actually be tracked via your TBA. So everybody now will have a transfer balance account which is like a running balance of what you've been doing. Um, starting pensions, commuting pensions, taking lump sums, getting divorced, any transaction like that will go debited and credited in typical accounting fashion against your TBA. So your TBC and your TBA are different things but connected. I'm hoping that we'll be able to sort of ring up the tax office and get your TBA at any time, but. I'm not sure if the tax office knows about that yet. Um, <laughs> now, if you've got more than 1.6 million currently in pension phase, what are you going to do? You have to transfer it into accumulation come the 1 July 2017. Or you can simply take it out. Um, let's not forget that's always an option. Uh, take it out, put it on the mattress. That's not financial advice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the subsequent earnings on the pension balance don't need to be withdrawn. I think this is an important factor that I, I emphasised back when it first came out and I want to make the point again that your growth on those earnings from that $1.6 million purchase price of your pension aren't affected by the TBC. So in other words, if you have a really good year and your $1.6 million goes to $2.6 million, you don't need to take out that $1 million excess. It doesn't need to be converted into accumulation it just carries forward. So in other words, you get the benefit of that growth and the tax exemption on those earnings. So in other words, get some growth assets in your pension balance. <coughs> Ooh, if the cap is exceeded, now you would say, why would you do this? Why would you go over your $1.6 million? I'll guarantee you it will happen. People will commence pensions greater than $1.6 million. And there'll probably be some tricky strategy where it's beneficial in some way. I'm not sure of it yet. But the way that what happens then is that they then calculate that there's notional earnings on that excess and they will tax you on them. Generously, they only tax you at 15% the first time you do it, <laughs> rising to 30% if you do it multiple times. Now it could happen inadvertently if you have multiple superannuation funds in multiple pensions and you don't tie all that together. The onus is really back on the individual to keep track of their own superannuation 
and how much they've got from a contribution point of view and also from sailing pensions point of view. So notional earnings will be taxed and the rest of it will be converted back to accumulation. It's going to be indexed. That 1.6 million will get indexed up um, in $100,000 increments. So in accordance with CPI, I'm not sure how long that may take to get to, but um, it will be. It will go up. Now, one of the most complicated parts of this, and something that while they flagged that it might be available, they didn't really go into much detail till it was released a couple of weeks ago. And this is where. I am tearing my hair out. Um, the beard's going grey out by the day trying to understand what the transitional CGT relief is. Now what this actually is, it applies, if you're in pension mode, prior to the 1st of July 2017, you may be eligible for CGT relief. But of course there's conditions. There's a lot of conditions. <laughs> now, what it means is that you get the choice to reset your cost base on your assets. So those Commonwealth Bank shares that you bought for $4.50 20 years ago, you get the choice of rolling that cost base to a current market value. And from my understanding, you can pick that at any time from now until the 30th of June. It has to be done at some point before the 1st of July. So whether or not that's a case of market goes gangbusters, you quickly make your elections, but once you make the election, you're stuck with it. So if you choose to take on, roll over your cost base into the new, or reset your cost base, that's it for good. So um, it does apply to both account-based pensions and transitional retirement income streams, which is something else that wasn't overly clear. It was a case of like, we were thinking with the transition retirement uh, income streams, you wouldn't be able to take advantage of something like this, but it does. So people with transition to retirement income streams may also want to reset their cost bases. Now, you might think it'd be just great to do it for everything. Well, potentially not. For a start, if you're in a loss situation at the moment, you wouldn't reset it uh, because you'd rather, why take on a lower cost base than you already have? So you, you do that. You can do it for each individual asset. So this is where it becomes an accounting nightmare. So if you've got 40 shareholdings in your self-managed super fund, for example, you can go through individually with your accountant or advisor and choose which ones you're going to reset the cost base for. Now, from that point on, one of the other negatives of it is that the 12 month discount period starts again. So if you were planning on selling those shares at any time in the future, or well maybe it's better to have the one third discount that's available in superannuation for having things for longer than 12 months. So it's a lot of crystal ball stuff going on, I think, moving forward with these cost bases, and this is why I'm concerned and confused as to how we're going to implement this on a case-by-case -case situation for everybody because we really need to nut out not only what has happened, what you want to be doing as well. Do you want to be selling these shares within the next 12 months? Is it going to be better? Like, you, you might end up rolling the dice doing it and you, you, you're worse off. I can see, while it's attractive with the CGT relief, a lot of people may be going back to the old, I might just sell before the 30th of June. Crystallise my own realised gains under the old system. Um, it's a lot easier, I know what I'm doing then, and I'll just start again. Uh, now I definitely don't advocate any washing of uh, capital gains, but the government definitely seems to be um, not making it easy to do anything else. It also depends on the method that you currently use for your tax exemption on your pension. So there's various methods, and I don't really want to labour this point too much because it is very specific for each individual person and how they're set up as to how this is going to apply to them. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of ramifications. Um, if you have a 100% pension, it's you, your wife, etc., all in pension phase, your class is segregated. Now, what you may have to do prior to the 30th of June is either make a contribution, or oh wait, I can't, well, you might have to commute part of your pension so you can take advantage of this. So there's so many variables in there that um, we're not quite sure of the practical application yet. Treasury and the ATO have waved around a big stick though, saying anybody that's trying to exploit these resets could potentially be engaging in any avoidance. Oh, okay, um, thanks for that. I think you're just trying to deal with the strategy at the time, but 
they do like to scare people and that might stop people from doing anything. Like they're really probably aiming at people that haven't already got pensions that may look to start pensions prior to the 1st of July. What are the reasons why you're starting pensions? Is it purely to reset your cost base? Well, they might come after you then. So there's a lot of things to consider with this. Um, and I think a lot more will come to light over the next six, seven months as we look at each person's individual situation. Now, another fun topic, the transition to retirement changes. Um, this was a great initiative when it came out. People wanted to cut back their hours and uh, transition to retirement could start accessing their superannuation. Whether that actually happened, probably not too much. What it actually meant was that people just started accessing their superannuation and taking advantage of the tax benefits that came with it. Why not? That's what the legislation was. So everybody received tax exempt income in their superannuation when they had a transition of retirement. Well, the government said no, no longer. Your earnings from the 1st of July will now be taxable in the superannuation fund. So you can still have it, by all means. They're not taking away your ability to transition retirement and re withdraw your superannuation via this. They're just saying you're not going to get any tax benefit for it anymore. The writing was probably always on the wall with this one. It was going to happen at some point. It was one of these seems too good to be true situations. Good news is it's still available this year. So happy days for the 2017 financial year. And the other thing that they also have been quick to crack down on was people treating their withdrawals from their income stream as lump sums and paying no tax on them. Um, so that was a little bit of a loophole that was available for a few months. They've said no longer. But once again, effective from the 1st of July 2017. So the window of opportunity still exists this year to take advantage of your transition to retirement income stream. The non-concessional contributions cap. So they got rid of the lifetime cap of 500,000. What, what did they give us instead? The annual limit of $100,000. So the irony here, I think, is that they brought out this sledgehammer from 3rd of May 2016, $500,000 limit applies. And by the way, it counts all your contributions back to 1st of July 2007. Everybody ran around, headless chook, what are we gonna do? We can't do anything. So then they had their revolt and suddenly come to an agreement that's going to be 100,000. And everybody breathes a sigh of relief. How good's this? We're so lucky now. Well, they sort of just scare you into thinking that this is a good deal now, which it is better, I guess, but $100,000 effective from the 1st of July 2017. Now, we've got another acronym. Everyone loves them by now. I hope we've had two good ones, TBCs, TBAs. Now everyone's got a TSB as well. Your total superannuation balance. Because there is a catch with your non-concessional contributions. You can only make non-concessional contributions if your TSB is below $1.6 million. So if you've got more than $1.6 million, no more non-concessional contributions from the 1st of July 2017. The bring forward still applies. So the bring forward rule is where you can bring forward two years worth of contributions and make three years in one hit. So that applies to this year. It will apply from 1 July 2017, but obviously the amount is, is greatly reduced. It's no longer three lots of 180,000, it's three lots of 100,000. So hence, um, we've got potentially a, a, a window of opportunity this year with it still being $180,000. Now, an important point is here for people that have small businesses. If you are a small business, your rollover concessions are outside of this non-concessional cap. So you can still be accessing those contributions in addition to your non-concessional contributions. Now that's potentially $500,000 or up to $1.415 million. So that's a, a big advantage uh, in addition to your non-concessional contributions. Clearly that concerns me um, when there is a section of the population that has an advantage. The government has made their intentions clear on creating an equal playing field. So I do worry that the writing may be on the wall for small business concessions, but at the moment, make hay while the sun shines. Um, I think it would be unfair if they do attack it because the reasoning behind it is that people in small business haven't had the ability to make the contributions throughout their lifetime. The benefit of this is that they sell their business and can then make those contributions. So it will really be unfair um, if they 
do bring that in, and I would hope uh, any, any change to that, and I would hope that there'd be some sort of grandfathering. But that didn't happen with anything else, so I get concerned. Um, the Division 293 tax, now, once again, an attack on the high earners. Um, an additional 15% contributions tax on the high earners. Now, who's a high earner? It used to be if you had over $300,000 in income, they've reduced it to 250000 They want to catch a lot more people. So that's coming from the 1st of July 2017. You pay your initial 15% when it goes in on your concessional contributions, you will be taxed an additional 15% if you earn over $300,000. It includes pretty much everything. They include your contributions, you add back your investment losses, fringe benefits, they want to catch as many people as they can with this and charge them an extra 15%. The point is, it's still more attractive than the top marginal tax rate, so they still leave some carrot for people to want to take advantage of and put their money into superannuation. So that's applied across the whole income? The whole income, well, it only applies to the contributions that exceed the $250,000 limit. So in other words, if you add all that up and your contributions for the year, were, you had $230,000 in income, your contributions for the year were 25000 giving you a total of 255000 they they'll only tax the 5000 anything that's in excess of that 250000 threshold. So if you've got $400,000 in income, then clearly they'll just tax the lot. But if you're around those uh, thresholds, that's where potentially you won't pay it on everything. And of course, they're smart enough to calculate that. So. I would still be making sure your accountant checks it thoroughly. Um, it can be paid personally. I think that's an important thing to remember. So rather than chewing up some of your limited superannuation that you can put in, you can actually pay this personally. So if you've got the cash flow, you've got the ability to do it, maybe choose to pay it personally. That's some sort of uh, concession they've made. Now I did say this at the, uh, the budget breakfast as well, the spouse superannuation tax offset. There's an 18% offset available if you make contributions for an eligible spouse, up to $540. Doesn't sound like much, but it's $540 that you may be able to get. If you're making contributions for your spouse and their income is between $10,800, or sorry, it's increasing the threshold from $10,800 to $37,000. So if their income is less than $37,000, you can claim an 18% tax offset. It's $540 that the government will just let you have if you're making contributions. That's effective from the 1st of July. That increase from 10,800 to 37,000, effective for the 2018 financial year, just like everything else seems to be. Um, the catch there is it does count towards their non-concessional contributions cap. So if you are making other non-concessional contributions, etc., keep in mind, don't exceed any caps. The low income superannuation tax offset, I won't labour this point because we've already got it. Uh, the refund of the 15% contributions tax for low income earners, it's just called something different. It's maximum of $500 if you earn under 37000 So all they've done, it was they got rid of this as part of the uh, mining resources tax uh, repeal. They're um, bringing it back. It replaces the LISC, so it's got a new name. Um, LISTO instead of LISC, uh, so if you're keeping track of the acronyms. But, yeah. Now what didn't make it? There was a couple of things. Unfortunately, they were planning on removing the work test. So that would have meant that everybody up to the age of 75 would have been able to contribute both concessional contributions and non-concessional contributions. That was going to be a great planning strategy where people could suddenly juggle their balances around from the point of view of that $1.6 million, even if you weren't working. Unfortunately, they took that away. So you have to be working still over the age of 65 to contribute to superannuation. Another thing they obviously didn't go forward with was the $500,000 crazy lifetime limit. Um, that would have been a nightmare to administer, I'm sure. Um, but all this other stuff isn't much better. Now, what didn't change, I do like to make the point again that there was some good news in the fact that some things didn't change. Uh, whatever you take out if you're over 60 is still tax free. Great news, if you're already in that situation, you can still rest assured that what you take out, you aren't taking up any tax on. And the maximum tax that you are paying in superannuation is still only 15%. It's still a very attractive tax rate. So despite all the ramifications of having to commute this, do that, not do this, 
you're still paying a maximum tax rate of 15%. So that's still potentially a good tax rate to be uh, in. Now what about this year? What, what, what's going to happen this year? The way all these changes, everything's 1st July 2017, well, nothing. It's actually exactly the same for the 2017 financial year as it was last year. Uh, the only thing that was changing was that lifetime limit and they got rid of it. So you can still be making concessional contributions of $30,000 if you're under 50 or $35,000 if you're over 50. Uh, there should be a 50 there. Um, and the non-concessional contributions are 180000 or you can still bring forward and do that $540,000 this year. So there's a window of opportunity, I say again, pre-30th of June, that you can be making these contributions and not be impacted by the, old, the, the new rules. And the big catch there is for people with more than $1.6 million. Come 1 July 2017, they won't be able to make a cent in non-concessional contributions, but 30th of June, they could whack in potentially up to 540000 So if you are planning on making any non-concessional contributions, keep in mind what your TSB, your total superannuation balance is, always likely to be um, come the 1st of July. And that's where that forward planning is going to be needed to go, not just what I've got at the moment, what am I going to have come the 30th of June? Uh, anyone got a crystal ball? Like, uh, the markets tend to dip at the end of the year, so maybe people will actually have less, hopefully, than they thought. Um, that would be a great result. Now, a few questions. I was going to run through a few scenarios. That's the, the nitty gritty of it all. Um, but I thought the best way to now try and give some perspective to it all is just to go through a few questions, situations, and then um, see how it all uh, applies. So I've got Barry, he's 55, and there should be a price for the first person that catches the theme of the names, I think. Um, <laughs> Barry is 55 and makes a non-concessional contribution of $320,000 on the 16th of April 2017. And then no more non-concessional contribution for the 3rd of June. What non-concessional contributions can he then make after the 1st of July? His TSB is 1.65 million. Pretty straightforward, I would say, after everybody's thoroughly listened to what I've said before. None. <laughs> he can't do anything. Um, he can't make any more non-concessional contributions. He could have made a further $220,000 if he'd put it in on the 30th of June, but that ticking over on the 1st of July spoils that opportunity, even though he triggered his bring forward. And that's an important point to, to think about. He triggered the bring forward of the 2017 year on the expectation that he would be able to put in that additional $220,000. Or no, it now links to your TSB, no more contributions. What if his TSB was 1.35? So let's get a bit more practical. It's under that, what's going to happen? $220,000? Can he put in that, that, that difference? Well, that would be, that'd be simple. So do you reckon he can? No, no, he can't. Why would he be able to do that? The government's involved. Um, <laughs> there's a new bring forward balance. Because he's triggered in 2017, he now has the limit for 2017 of 180000 Then he takes on the next two years' limits of 100000 So his new bring forward balance is $380,000. Not five hundred forty, even though he triggered it in this year. He didn't utilise it all in this year. So he can only make... $60,000 contribution come the 1st of July 2017. So you do take on the new limits moving forward, which is something to keep in mind if you are making contributions and triggering the bring forward, but potentially not using it all. Um, now, if he happened to have made 390000 in the, this year, and his limit moving forward, but not the rest, was three hundred and eighty. It's just badly. He doesn't have to take 10 grand out. They're not going to force him to, to take it out again. Um, but he can't make any more because he's used up that, that full limit. Um, so Michelle is 52. And she has a TSB at the 30th of June 2017 of 1.45 million. So what is the maximum non concessional she can make in the 2018 financial year? You'd think that's pretty straightforward too. 300,000, isn't it? She's under, under 65. She can bring forward two years worth, it's 100,000 now. No, once again, that'd be too easy. Let's not keep it too simple. Let's make sure everybody is 
extremely confused and focused on what their TSB is moving forward. Oh, they've got a scale, depending on what your balance is as to how much you can actually put in. So if you've got less than 1.4, then yes, you can take advantage of the full three years. If you lie between the 1.4 and 1.5, it's only two years you can bring forward because that's effectively putting you over the 1.6. So they don't want that to happen. No, you're not getting that. Um, 1.5 to 1.6, 100,000. So they really make it hard. A TSB was between 1.4 and 1.5, so she can only do the 200,000. Now, a point with this is that it is to the dollar. If you've got $1,599,999 in your superannuation fund at the 30th of June in any particular year, you can make a $100,000 non-concessional contribution. Even though that's clearly going to take you over, you can. So I think there should be a lot of accruing of accounting fees uh, at the 30th of June for those people around the $1.6 million mark. Um, and you'll thank me later for getting in $100,000. <laughs> The other thing is that it's a moving target. So while your TBA that we talked about earlier with your pensions is locked in when you start your pension, your $1.6 million of your total superannuation balance could fluctuate up and down on a yearly basis, um, depending on economic conditions, etc. So you might have $1.7 million one year, have a bad year and you got 1.5, suddenly you can contribute again. Whether you can put it in the pension phase is a different story. And I think that's where Unfortunately, the government's using this 1.6 million to mean multiple things. So we have to make sure we know that they are different things. Um, how, how did we arrive at the 1.6 million figure? And the other question is, is that going to be indexed? Yes, it is going to be indexed. It's actually indexed in uh, a WATI. Um, so once again, keeping track of that. I'm not sure of the increments that they'll in, uh, but I would suggest it would be fairly large ones, probably the 100,000 again. But look, they came to that, and my understanding where they came to that is the Labor had their proposal where they were wanting to give you the first $75,000 of income from your pension as tax-free and tax everything else. So the LNP came out and goes, mm, well, the average earning rate is about 5%. We're going to be more generous than Labor. So we'll say 5% of $1.6 million is $80,000 you get tax-free. So they've sort of done a bit of a, a work back and come up with this magical number of 1.6 that they think is a, a valid amount that people can have the tax exemption on in their superannuation, all based on that earnings of $80,000. The difference is you could have earnings of $500,000 and it's all tax free, happy days. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's where their rhyme or reason uh, happened there. Now what if she contributes $150,000 in the 2018 year? So she's got a balance, as we go back, of 1.45. She puts in $150,000. And then on the 30th of June 2018, her TSB is 1.6. What could she do in the 2019 financial year? Nothing. So essentially, it's it, once again that moving target. You make your contributions and suddenly you don't make all the contributions you can do and your balance is 1.6 million you're stopped in your tracks. You can't do any more contributions. Yes. Ah, there we go. You need to move back to That's right, I'll get back to where we were. So zero, she can't do anything uh, more. So the one thing that I want to be uh, getting through is that moving target of this 1.6 million. And it's a use it or you may lose it system now. So don't just assume that just because you've triggered your bring forward, like you used to, that you can then make your further contributions in the coming financial years. It all still just depends on what your, your balance is as to whether you'll be able to make those contributions or not. It's a moving target. Keep it in mind each year. Um, valuations are obviously going to become even more and more important. Uh, pressure on valuing things down will become more and more important and auditors will be scrutinising, as will the uh, tax office because there is ramifications for getting it under that 1.6 million. So it makes everybody's job harder. Um, and also make sure you include all your superannuation funds. So you go, I've got 1.5 million here, and you forgot about another one that you had $100,000 in. That's still counted. Be aware of it and um, don't go over it. Now, even if, you, if you've got more than $1.6 million and you can't make any more non-concessional contributions, 
bear in mind you can still do your concessional contributions. So that's not based on your balance. Your ability to make concessional contributions and claim tax deductions still exists even with um, a high balance. And the 1.6 million doesn't include pension schemes overseas that might be recognised as pension schemes as purely... No, anything overseas, and that's another point that... Um, Unfortunately, the way that they've structured this is that pensions overseas, if you were to bring them into Australia, do get counted towards your non-concessional limits. So in other words, you're limited to that $100,000 and also if you've got already $1.6 million, you can't do it. So it's one of these debates that um, I would hope does continue. There's a few uh, groups lobbying for it because it seems to be wouldn't we want people to be bringing their money from overseas into Australia? Seems to make, make more sense, but um, no, they, they, they're sort of restricting yeah. that. There's no exemption for overseas pension transfers. So they're still uh, counted towards the non-concessional, the reduced non-concessional limits. And of course, the old re-contribution strategies where you would take money out and put it back in again to change your taxable component, a tax-free component, etc or even just taking it out to re-contribute as a concessional contribution, it, that's getting reduced. Like the, a lot of these strategies that we've been doing for years, while they're still able to be done, cutting these limits just reduces the impact. Um, so there'll be lots of strategy moving forward. Now I've got another one, a Donald. Moving forward from non-concessionals, we'll move into the pension side of things. Does anybody have any questions about non-concessional contributions? Um, it is one of the big headline Dis discussion topics. Um, I, I, I hope it, it seems to be a little bit easy to get your head around, I think, because um, it does sort of just be well, if I've got 1.6, I can't do anything. If I've got less than that, I've got to talk to my accountant um, to make sure I can. So it, it, it's a case of um, hopefully a bit, a bit simpler to, to understand, but no questions regarding non concessional? David? Yeah, if you move to look at resetting your um, capital gains tax yep. situation, um, is there a point you say, okay, the cost benefit analysis, if I've got 1.8 or, mm. you know, is it, or I've got 3 million or whatever, and you, you work out a figure where you say, look, it's not worth it. You know, if you've got 1.7, you've got under 2, by the time you pay all the fees, don't Go on a holiday. Pay. With it, <laughs> pull it out and spend it. Yeah. Potentially, I think there'll be a lot of that, and I'll cover more into the um, the, the, the TBC uh, in the next few questions. But there will be a lot of situations, I think, where you go, is it worth having some of these like amounts in superannuation still? Um, if you are just getting over that fringe, because especially where if you reduce it down under the 1.6, you've got the ability to contribute it back in again. Um, so potentially. Variable factors in there, you've got to be able to access it, you've got to be able to pull it out in the first place. If you're 42 and you've got $1.7 million, there's not much you can do, you can't pull it out, so you're just stuck not being able to contribute anymore. If you're 67, different playing field. So um, that's some of the strategy that may be there. Pat, did you have a question? Um, yeah, to understand it right, uh, you've got uh, 1.6 million. Mm. You can you can uh, contribute um, after-tax money uh, above that as much as you like. Is this that year, right? you oh, can, only, only up to the, if you've got $1.6 million in super, yeah. currently for the year ending 30th of June 2017, you can do your non-concessional contributions. So your $180,000 a year, right. or if you're under 65, potentially up to 540, come um, 30th of June, if you've got more than $1.6 there's no more contributions at all. <coughs> Non-concessional contribution, sorry. Okay. So, hence, there is that time frame and that window in the next six months to potentially use it or lose it. It might be your last opportunity to get contributions in, non-concessional contributions into super. Unless there's another GFC and suddenly your balance cuts in half and uh, suddenly, wow, you can contribute again. You know, that's, I don't think too many people wish for that. I'd rather just not contribute. Um, so, we've moved on to Donald, who's 70. Anyone starting to yes, hit the yes, scene? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Presidents and wives. Yeah, Barry, Barry and Michelle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Barry, yes. Um, yeah, Donald's 70. He actually is, by the way. Um, he's 70 and has an account-based pension in his SMSF. 
Now he hasn't done too, you know, he hasn't thought much about Super. He's only got 2.4 million in there, Barry, uh, Donald. Like, I would have thought he would have had a lot more, but um, he spends a lot. Like, we haven't seen his tax records yet, remember, so we don't know what he's actually got. Um, no, he's got 2.4 million at the 30th of June 2017. So, what's going to happen? What happens? He's just sat back and gone, what am I going to do? Well, come the 1st of July, he'll have 1.6 million in an account based pension and 800,000 into accumulation. So he doesn't have to withdraw that from superannuation. I think that was a bit of a fear when these first came out going, if I've got more than that, do I just have to take it out? No, you can leave it in there and it still will just be attracting that accumulation tax rate of 15%. So no requirement to take that out. And the other thing is like with pensions, you have a minimum pension amount that you have to take out each year, depending on your age. Starting at 4%, going upwards until 15%. Um, if you've got an accumulation mode, you can just leave it in there forever. So maybe that's not a bad thing. So that 15% tax rate indefinitely, not a bad option. And just to be clear, clear on that, yep. that's 15% tax on the earnings. On the earnings, exactly right. Yeah, the, the, so the tax. If you earn anything, then yeah. If you've got zero earnings, um, or you've got assets that they're just sort of non-yielding, for example, um, or you've just got your money in the bank and it pays zero percent tax pretty, um, interest, pretty much. You don't pay tax. Um, your accounting fees might be enough to uh, <laughs> to offset it. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> what number would you like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you need to get it below the 1.6 million? Isn't it? Then I'll accrue it. Um, what are the taxation implications of that then? Well, the earnings on the pension portion remain tax-free and the earnings on the accumulation are 15%. But that tricky CGT relief may apply. And I stress the word may because it's going to be different for every single investment asset you have and the current strategy that you've got in place. So unfortunately, everybody with more than $1.6 million will have to probably talk to me at some point over the next six months. I say unfortunately, no, nobody Wanted to pipe up and say that'd be great, Clive. We can't wait. Um, <laughs> that'd be fine. Um, right. So Donald has some high-yielding assets. So you know those growth stocks that are paying a big dividend, etc. Can he put that in his pension side so he doesn't pay any tax on it? Sounds great. No, unfortunately not. There's an integrity measure restricting the ability to segregate. So this was one of the strategies I was talking about at, after the budget saying we will be able to sit down and segregate some assets into your pension, other assets into your accumulation. Segregation exists at the moment. It's a, it's a viable strategy between accumulation and pension. And it, it will exist moving forward, but not for anybody with more than $1.6 million. The integrity measure will crack down on you. So they don't want people taking advantage of segregating and putting their dividend yielding stocks in the tax free and their bank interest yielding cash in the accumulation. So is there anything you can do about this? What can you do? Like that seems, you know, surely there's something, Clyde, think of something that we can do about this. Well, I have. <laughs> he could take the money out uh, of the super fund, put it in his own name. That's one option. Or a better option, potentially, is have it in a separate self-managed superannuation fund. So you could get the situation where you have your $1.6 million full of your high yielding growth assets over in this one fund, earning whatever you want and paying zero tax. Have all your other, like your, your defensive or your low yielding in another fund, which is taxable. Now, the alternative, if you have it all in the one fund, is that you're paying a proportion of tax on the earnings on those growth assets. So it's going to be this juggling effect of going, well, what is it worthwhile? Another discussion to have um, with your trusted advisors, what should we be doing? Should we be taking it out, putting it in our own name? If you have zero personal income at the moment, which a lot of retirees would because the plan was always get everything into superannuation, you pay no tax on it, and you pay no tax on taking it out, why not throw it in there? Well, now you have the situation where you go, I might want some income in my own name. 
I can have up to $18,200 in the tax-free threshold of income. Um, now, between a husband and wife, that's potentially $36,000. Like, if you've got half a million dollars in the bank, you'd be flat out getting $36,000 in interest in a year. So it does definitely be a viable strategy, I think, taking some money out of superannuation. Sounds funny for me to be um, talking about that. And there is obviously the implication that you may have to be doing a tax return if it does start to creep up over that. But um, I might know a few people that can help you with that as well. Um, or the second self-managed super fund. Depending on what your assets are, what the tax implications are, maybe it's worthwhile making sure they all are 100% tax free in a separate self-managed super fund. Um, if you're going to be realising large capital gains, yes, there's this rollover relief, but will it apply? It's not going to be 100% because it, it only takes a line in the sand at the 30th of June. So who knows? And you can roll over listed assets, listed shares, um, cash, etc., to another superannuation fund. Business real property, there are restrictions, but it depends on what you are. So strategy that may be worth discussing um, at some point. And, and ironically, like we, we'll end up seeing potentially the 550,000 self-managed super funds currently in Australia explode from people suddenly having two, maybe even three. Like if you, you have, depending on what your situation is, um, who knows? There's other ramifications for estate planning that I won't go into. So yeah, it, it, it's a complicated situation. Now, his balance has gone from 2.4 million at the 30th of June 2017 to 3 million at the 30th of June 2018. So what, what impact does that have? It's a good year. That's, that's not too bad. Like, uh, well done, Don. He, he must have some sort of influence over the markets. Um, <laughs> it's applied proportionally between those. So once again, because the assets aren't split between pension and accumulation, they just grow in proportion. So he's now got a pension of $2 million and an accumulation account of $1 million. Now his financial advisor, Ivanka, turns out to be not very good. Um, hopefully that's not the case, but his balance drops to 1.5 million. And that leaves him, under that proportioning, $1 million in pension and $500,000 in accumulation. Well, can he top that up? Can he go, well, I've only got a million dollars now, I want to have my 1.6 again. Can I just roll that $500,000 in? No, because his investment losses don't decrease the transfer balance cap. Unfortunately, he's stuck with his $1 million in pension phase. So it's one of the things that doesn't get manipulated through your transfer balance account. If he took a lump sum out, yes, that comes off that 1.6 and he could start more pension, but investment losses aren't, unless it's a result of fraud and somebody, which is the catch, is actually convicted over it. Now, I don't know too many situations where people have even been convicted. The Storm Financial guys didn't get convicted, so good luck. Thanks for putting that in the legislation, but the chances are it will never actually be used. Um, so he's stuck with that. There is some good news. He can make a contribution, though. He's got less than 1.6 million. Is he working? Um, I'm not sure. Um, maybe. <laughs> maybe he will be. And he's over 70. He could make a contribution. Now, Bill and Hillary have superannuation balances of $2 million and $1 million, respectively. What are they going to do? How do they equalise their benefits? Because he's going to be having an accumulation balance and she's not. They both work for now too, by the way, um, for this current financial year at least. Um, I'm not sure what they'll be doing in the future, but they do work. Um, so Bill has unrestricted access. So he can take out what he wants. Hillary has less than $1.6 million, so she can contribute in dribs of $100,000 non-concessional a year. But she's got right up to the age of 75 if she's working to do that. So it's a bit of a long-term strategy, but come 1 July 2017, he will be having a pension account of 1.6, accumulation account of 400,000. There's nothing to stop him pulling that accumulation out each year, giving it to Hillary while she's working and boosting hers up. She'll be commencing a pension with 1.1 1 .1 million, sorry, one, yeah, 1 million at the 1st of July. Every 100000 that comes in, she can just start a new pension, start a new pension, start a new pension, till they get there. Now, can they do contribution splitting? I'm not sure if people recall the contribution splitting strategy, but that's going to be a bit topical, I think, moving forward for 
uh, people that are having concessional contributions and have uneven super balances. It's where you make your concessional contributions in a year and you decide to split them over to your spouse. So 85% take off the contributions tax can be split into your spouse's name. Now it's not a huge amount moving forward, it's only $25,000, but it's still something. It's better than it going against your name and pushing you further and further over the, the 1.6 million, split it off to your spouse. So can they do that? No, unfortunately she's over 65. There's age-based restrictions on doing it. You have to be below preservation age or between preservation age and 65 and not retired. So even though she's still working, she's over 65 so she can't do it. So that's not a strategy. But for people that are in that situation, if you're under 65, potentially you could be um, utilising a contribution splitting strategy. So keep in mind that. There's, those are the few sort of strategies. That withdrawal, recontribution is non-concessional if able to, and contribution splitting that we can utilise to equalise balances going forward. There is another one that I didn't put in the slides, but you can always get divorced and have a superannuation split, um, which doesn't get counted either uh, and comes off your balance. So um, I'm not advising that, that's why I don't want it in the written material. Unfortunately, I realise they're filming it. Um, <laughs> don't see me about that one, I was never here. Um, now the main points for the TBC, um, it's different to the TSB, remember. So while the TSB is a moving target, once you use your TBC up, it's gone. So if you lose it all in a bad investment, you can't start new pensions up to that 1.6 million. So same figure at the moment, but completely different um, applications. So keep that in mind. There is no requirement to withdraw the excess. If you've got more than 1.6 million, rest assured, you don't have to all of a sudden rip it all out or give it to your accountant. Um, <laughs> you can keep it in superannuation. And unfortunately, while you've got one fund, you can't segregate your assets. Great in theory, was going to be a very useful strategy, but obviously the government got wind of it before they wrote the legislation and quickly put in their integrity measure. Um, however, you can have two funds, and I should say, as bias I am towards self-managed super funds, you can have it in any sort of retail or industry fund, obviously, um, that, that, you know, it's still superannuation, it has the same effect. Right, any questions about the, the TBC, uh, the, the pensions transfer balance cap, I, it's, it's fairly confusing, Bart. Um, let's say you <clears throat> you've got your 1.6 million in a in a pension fund. Yep. Uh, and you've got another million, say, um, that that was in there. So you've got to transfer that to an accumulation fund. Mm. Now, can you withdraw the money from the accumulation fund tax free? But it it it, accum it, it its earnings um, get taxed at 15 percent. Yep. Can can you access them? Yeah, so it's a good question. It's a case of can you withdraw from that accumulation fund, leave your pension account as much as possible because it's tax-free earnings and withdraw from your accumulation fund and pay no tax? Well, that is still just based on your age. If you're over 60, then the answer is yes. Any money you withdraw from superannuation is tax-free. So you can take a lump sum from your accumulation account and it will be tax-free. So you can keep drawing your pension from your 1.6 million. Yep. And you can presumably you can't take a pension out of your your, your other your mm, No, it's a slight difference. But you can withdraw lump sums. Exactly. So in other That's words, if you withdraw more than your minimum pension each year, so whether it's your four percent, five percent, six percent, whatever it is, and you have more than 1.6 million, come next year, what you'll be doing is taking your minimum amount out of your pension account and everything else out of your accumulation account. Now another important fact, I touched on it before about lump sums, is that they, say you've only got $1.6 million and you pull out your minimum pension and you want more. Now you could treat it as a pension payment, but your alternative is to actually do it as a lump sum, which comes, like reduces your TBA, your balance um, account, and hence, at some point in the future, you could potentially start 
use that, like start new pensions with that money if you're able to contribute, for example. So it becomes a distinction between pension withdrawals and lump sum withdrawals. I think what we'll see is a lot more lump sums than just the pension um, withdrawals moving forward. But that's all depending on what you take out during the year. You have to take your minimum and you need to be careful to take your minimum pension before you think about taking any lump sums because you want to be maintaining that tax exemption in there. But yes, if you're over 60, still tax free, whatever you do. So the strategy moving forward will obviously be use up your accumulation, spend it, don't touch your tax free money as, for as long as possible, except for that minimum. Any other questions regarding that? I'll touch briefly on, um, and I don't want to lay the point because once again it will get confusing, but what happens in the event of someone passing away? Now it has been discussed as to, at the moment, everyone's got this $1.6 million tax-free amount they can have in pension. Now if somebody, one of the spouses was to pass away, can that just revert to the other one and they can now have $3.2 million? The short answer is no, they can't that ceases, their ability to access their $1.6 million uh, tax-free pension ceases on death. So there will once again be some tricky planning that is needed um, to keep that in superannuation. Now, without getting too technical on it, what you have to do is commute your pension and take on the pension of your spouse um, to be able to maintain it all. Otherwise, it will have to be physically paid out of superannuation. So, even in the event of death, it gets even more complicated. Gone is the fact that it just reverts to the spouse, everything's tax-free, um, let's move forward. Once again, planning will be needed and, and considered for what's going to happen at that point um, and the tax ramifications, um, not as straightforward as it potentially uh, is at the moment. All right, so we've got Mike, who's currently in receipt of a transition retirement income stream. Now, given this is been removed the, the exemption that he receives on his tax um, taxable income in the fund. Is that going to be worthwhile continuing come the first of July? Potentially, it could be. Uh, why not? Uh, he may actually be transitioning in retirement. He may just need the money. So by all means, he can still access this transition retirement income stream to top up his other income. He'll be paying tax if he's under 60 on the withdrawals, but, and he'll still be paying the earnings tax in the super fund at 15%, but he's got that access to it if he needs it or wants it. If he's over 60, it's actually tax free, let's remember. So he can be pulling it out. He might want to pay down non-deductible debt, put it back in to take advantage of the concessional contribution limits or um, just spend it. Uh, why not? He could. Um, it's, it's still, potentially a viable strategy. And the one thing to keep in mind is that the CGT relief does apply to the transition retirement income streams. So you may still want to be maintaining your transition retirement income streams because of the CGT relief. So there is potential for transition retirement income streams to not just fade away. They're still going to be around. They still may be used. You may need it for any number of reasons and you can still access it. Now, once again, to reiterate, transition retirement income streams, the maximum amount you can withdraw is 10%. So maybe it's not worthwhile, but potentially it is. Um, and it's not limited to that $1.6 million either. So you could have $10 million and you could have a transition retirement income stream with it because it's not part of that transfer balance cap. That's only relating to retirement pensions. Now this isn't a retirement pension, so it's not subject to that cap and anyone you start doesn't count towards your TBA either so um, it's separate. Something else we'll probably see just if I wanted something more to do in the next six months is start analysing people's um, condition of release opportunities. So in other words currently Mike's on the transition retirement income stream at the moment it doesn't really matter if it's a transition income uh, transition to retirement income stream or an account based pension if he's only pulling out the minimum, the tax implications are the same. Come 1 July 2017, they're vastly different. So maybe he's actually retired. Um, now what's that? If his preservation age is 60, he has to cease gainful employment with no intention of returning um, to work at any point in the future. 
Now that's an important distinction. And you have to have that intention when you cease work that you are not going to return. You can't have your party on Friday and turn up at the office on Monday. That may be a little bit contrived. But if you legitimately have no intention to return to work, then suddenly you've satisfied the condition of, time, um, condition of release and you can access that $1.6 million TBC. Circumstances may change, let's not forget, and you may go back to work. That doesn't nullify that. As long as your intention at the time of retirement was that you were never going to go back, it's valid. Now, if you're over 60 and under 65, it's a bit easier. All you've got to do is cease a gainful employment arrangement. So you could have four jobs, you stop one of them, your whole balance is now unrestricted and comes under that transfer balance cap. So that is probably the one we will see more of. Maybe there'll be people under 60 that just go, I'm done, I'm retiring, let's just get it over and done with. But I think there'll be a lot of people that potentially can satisfy this second condition of release, um, or already have. And that's the thing, it hasn't probably been considered. They've just stopped doing a job last year or something and didn't really think much of it. Well, suddenly, they could get access to the TBC and get that $1.6 million tax-free pension. So it's definitely something to keep in mind and something that uh, we'll be obviously talking to everybody that's on a transition of retirement income stream as to whether they actually do meet one of these conditions of release. Um, hopefully it doesn't meet the condition of release of death. Um, that's also a condition of release. It would then just become an account-based pension. <laughs> now, is it over yet? I I'm not actually talking about my speech. Uh, <laughs> some of you are probably hoping so. <laughs> um, what I mean is the changes to superannuation. Is it over yet? Well, Scott Morrison has promised promised that the government will not take any further changes to superannuation to the next election. That's interesting wording he did use there. Next election's still a while away. Um, maybe, maybe there will be changed before then. But anyway, he's not taking any further changes to the next election. So thanks very much, Scott. We believed you last year when you said you weren't going to make anything retrospective. And Actually, it was early this year, in February, and you lied about that. But let's just see. Now... Uh, Labor's still not happy. They don't like it the way it is, so they do want further changes. They've said they will make further changes. They want to reduce that non-concessional limit to 75,000 from 100. They want to keep the 10% rule. Bad luck if you want access to a personal tax deduction for your contributions. Labor doesn't want you to. Um, they don't like the catch-up concessional contributions either. They say that it's not really aimed at the uh, returning to work mothers, it's actually your high income earners are going to take advantage of that, possibly, but once again, you shut the door on some people, it shuts it on everybody. So those people that legitimately would be able to suddenly boost their retirement savings um, with that won't get the opportunity. And they want to reduce that Div 293 threshold, that extra contributions tax from, well, went from 300 down to the current 250 that we have from the 1st of July 2017. They want to catch even more people and get it at $200,000. So whether these will be what they actually go to the election with in a few years' time, I don't know. All it does is signal their intent to still make changes. They're leaving that door open. They don't want people to feel happy that it is what it is. So once again, the period of uncertainty continues. The government's trying to say no, they're not going to. Everybody takes that with a grain of salt nowadays, but Labor has flagged they definitely aren't happy and will make changes. Um, so maybe there'll be more to come in the future. So things to do before 30th of June 2017. What should you do in the next seven months? Talk to your Henry current advisor. It's complicated. That's pretty much it because I can't give any more financial advice um, <laughs> in this forum. But Henrik Curran has been licensed since the 1st of July 2016 to give strategic advice. So the government made us become licensed advisors and the timing probably couldn't be better because now we can actually assist people with their strategic financial plans, not just what they can be doing, but what they should be doing. Um, so by all means, Avail yourself of our services. We've got a number of uh, licensed advisors in the in the room tonight. Actually, Tim Taylor's here, Angie Winton's here. A lot more people able to do it. 
Ben, you could uh, sign up any time uh, and we can give the advice on this. So keep that in mind. Um, now, however, things to consider. So I'm not giving financial advice, but things that you may want to consider before the 30th of June 2017. What concession and non-concession of contributions you're going to make? The increased, oh, I say increased, but they've been decreasing for years, but the higher thresholds still are there this year. This window of opportunity that I'll nag away at is there until the 30th of June to make potentially more concessional and non-concessional contributions uh, before the 30th of June. So plan for that. If your super balance is more than $1.6 million, start thinking about how that's going to impact you. And that's not just from the contribution point of view, but also either your potential retirement in the future or your current pension that you have in place. So $1.6 million, look at the situation. What impact does this have on your estate planning? Have some of the strategies that you've got in place suddenly gone out the window? And I've touched on the reversionary pensions. Suddenly, while it still may be able to be done, there's changes that are needed. So talk to your accountants, talk to your lawyers. Is there any impact on these, um, with these changes on your estate planning? Especially if you start going down the, the, the path of pulling money out of super, putting it in different superannuation funds, what are the nominations and all those? How is that taken care of in your will? Don't forget about super if you, if you move it over there and there's a completely different beneficiary that you have on, on your existing super, it's all got to be considered when you make changes. Um, so before you do any changes, consider the impact on your estate. Is it going to be worthwhile for transition retirement? Something else. Sit down, have a discussion. Is it worthwhile this year? Obviously, it's still the same, so continue doing what you're doing. Come 1 July, maybe it's not worth any more, turn it off. It was good while it lasted, not anymore. And the CGT relief. This is going to be a case-by-case -case situation, but everybody with more than $1.6 million and a pension in place especially um, will need to consider what they're going to do in the next seven months as to their cost basis. Whether or not they want to be resetting them or should be resetting them and then talking to us about it. And the member balances, start that now while you can. And this year with that window of opportunity with the contributions is a good opportunity to do it if able to. Make contributions, make withdrawals um, and, and equalise the member balances. Ironically, it used to not have any impact especially when they, uh, superannuation became a marital asset and in the event of divorce it didn't matter, it was all just lumped in together. So whose name it was in wasn't a big deal. People tended to put more in the older spouse's name so they could access it sooner. Well, suddenly that's all gone out the window and you really want to be taking advantage of both spouses, uh, TBCs, transfer balance caps, um, for everyone keeping track of acronyms. So that's pretty much it. I'll be around, um, obviously, afterwards if anybody wants to talk to me specifically about anything. Um, or, as I said, I'm freely available to meet with people to talk about specific situations. And those of you that um, obviously I know and need to be discussed with before the 30th of June, I'll probably be contacting you <laughs> to make sure it gets done. All right. Thanks, guys.